Hello, my name is Pat Allen and I help with interviews for the Veterans History Project for the Library of Congress in Washington. And that program is administered here in Cincinnati at the Hamilton Cincinnati, Cincinnati Hamilton County Public Library. And it is directed by Brian Powers, who is also our cameraman today. And today's date is April the 23rd, 2019, and we have the pleasure and privilege of interviewing Ralph Link, a World War II veteran. Uh, Mr. Link, thank you for coming to do this interview. My pleasure. And, uh, can we call you Ralph? Is that how you're mostly known by? Absolutely. All right. Well, Ralph, uh, let's start by uh, telling us where and when you were born. Well, I was really born in, this is going to shock you, Cranberry Prairie, Ohio, and which is up in Mercer County, and I went to St. Henry High School up there. W and when were you born? What was your birth date? Uh, December 21st, 1925. 1925. Yeah. And uh, what are your parents' names? So my parent name, my dad was Urban Link, and he was a farmer, and uh, my mother was, uh, she was a mulein camp. And uh, we lived in uh, Cranberry Prairie, Ohio, up there. And how many brothers and sisters uh, did you have? I'm I'm one of seven children. Uh, my uh, I had one brother who was two years older than I am, and uh, he enlisted to Wright Patterson Field into the Army into the Air Force uh, uh, two years ahead of me, and he was flying P-51s in one year's time in the Air Force, and that's why I decided to enlist at Wright-Patterson in the Air Force. Right. And what, what were your other siblings, uh, boys and girls? Well, I had an older sister, Edna, who was a hairdresser. Uh, she was the oldest in the family. And then my brother, Melvin, uh, was the one that went from the farm to flying P-51s and uh, went to the Pacific with him. And uh, then I had uh, three uh, sisters, uh, four sisters uh, eventually. There was Edna, Hulda, Viola, and Eileen, and uh, P.S. 15 years later, Bernice, when my mother was 44 years old. Uh, so, that's so that's the seven children, and uh, we all stayed around the area there. Now, are any of them still living? The P.S. is living only. Right. I, I'm, I'm the only one of the original six. Uh, Bernice is uh, still living. She's uh, in her 70s now. And the P.S. means what? Uh, well, on a letter when you have an afterthought. <laughs> <laughs> Fifteen years later, and a, a little uh, humor in here is my, my uh, older sister said, I want to get married in December. And my mom said, you can't get married in December. She said, why not? She said, I'm pregnant. I'm going to have a child that month. <laughs> she said, oh, those old people. <laughs> <laughs> so um, are you married? Yes, I got married. And what's your wife's name? It's uh, Esther. She was a Himmel Garden. And uh, she, she went two years to Fort Recovery High School and then moved over to St. Henry. That's when I met her one. She was a, a junior and I was a senior. And uh, we, we got married in June the 9th, 1949. So in June the 1st, one month from now, we're celebrating our 70th wedding anniversary. Oh, congratulations, well, congratulations. You're welcome if I make it. I got one month to go. <laughs> now, you, you told us that your dad, was, uh, your dad was a farmer. How about your mother? Did she work outside the home or was nope. she busy raising the family? She was busy raising the family. All right. And how about your wife? How about uh, Esther? Is, has she worked outside the home? Esther is a registered nurse put through the nursing school by the government at that time. As a cadet, she is officially a veteran of World War II. All right. But she was not called up. And she, she did get called up in the Korean War uh, as a ensign in the Navy, but they canceled it before she left, Ohio, left. you know, that war was very funny all at once it was over. So that's her military service type thing. She was a 
registered nurse. So where'd she get her nurse's training through the government? St. Elizabeth's Hospital in Dayton, Ohio, and that, which is now gone, but uh, yes. So uh, uh, after she was uh, released from military service the Korean War, what, what did she do afterwards? Just taking, you guys got married in 49, was it? Yes, yeah, so we got married in 49, and uh, she worked in the hospital in Dayton okay. for a time, and then uh, I, I became employed with Chrysler Corporation, the air temp division, uh, out of college. Well, let's, let's of, after, after the war, I went to UD, we got, became a mechanical engineer after the war. All right, well, where, where'd you graduate from high school and when? Me? Yes. 1944. At St. Henry High School. St. Henry? Yeah. Uh, that's in Mercer County? That's, yeah, it's in Mercer County, all right, yep. And the, how soon did you enlist after graduation from high school? I think I went directly to Wright Patterson Field the next day and enlisted if it wasn't a couple days before. What did your parents think about your enlisting in the Air Force? There was, well, at that time, I think the mental attitude was hey, if, if they got a Go, they got to go, and, and they they went. My wife had five brothers in there in the service during the war, and uh, they all came home without a scratch. Even though two of them were in the Battle of the Bulbs with Patton and so forth, all right. and uh, one of them got off a submarine, and uh, the submarine went out, and we never haven't seen it since in well, seventy so, years. So how, how did he happen to get off the submarine before it left the uh, well, harbor? He had disagreement with the commander of the submarine, and the commander said, well, if you don't like me, get off. And then when they went to Hawaii to refuel and restock everything, he got off. He went out, and it never never came back. They don't know whatever happened to that submarine. So that's a brush right there. So you, you told us a little bit about your brother. That's Melvin, right? Yes. He was a P-51 pilot. and. Uh, I think he ended up uh, flying over the hump over in Burma, yeah, in India. And, yeah, as I told you, he, he went through flight school within a year and a half and flying P-51s, and he went to Panama shortly and flew P-39s uh, for a period of time, and then he came back and they uh, put him in a, a P-51 pilot, and uh, his, his, his group went to Europe, and he got the mumps so he couldn't go. <laughs> He had to stay home, and uh, when he went back after a month uh, getting rid of the mumps, uh, they sent him to India, and he flew the hump to China and Japan uh, for the rest of the war. Did he tell you of any scrapes he had uh, over uh, well, flying the hump? Yeah, his biggest thing was uh, flying through the mountains over the hump. The Japanese would have uh, straight, uh, you know, sharpshooters at 20, 25,000 feet in the, up there in the mountains and you had to know how to duck them. Yeah, but he never got knocked down. Good. He had a few bullet holes, maybe. All right. So uh, you and one, one other weird thing, he said the biggest problem in, with the, all the servicemen and workmen in India, they would break the wingtip red lights out. You know, they had red lights and a wingtip that flash, and they'd take all those red lights and make jewelry out of them. And claim they were rubies, so they had to keep replacing the lights <laughs> on the wingtips. So uh, you, you enlist at Wright Patterson Air Force Base, and uh, t take us through your training. And um, yeah, I enlisted at Wright Patterson, passed the test for pilot and navigator and bombardier, and then I cho chose to go the pilot route. Now you passed uh, you passed all those at the same time, didn't you? Yes all at one time, and uh, I, I was indoctrinated into the service at uh, Indiana, Fort Harrison, and from there uh, we went around to Keesler Field in Mississippi, and uh, while we were there we got, went through basic training, which everybody did when they got into the service, they had to have basic training. And after basic training, they shipped us to Spence Field in Moultrie, Georgia, uh, to wait to go to pilot school, and we were there for oh, a couple months. And uh, at, at that time, 
the European war was ending and uh, we were, everything was going to the South Pacific and they said they were going to discontinue training pilots and said, if you guys want to get in this war, uh, we'd like you to resign from that status and uh, become gunners because we're going to load up the B-29s, which of course took half a dozen gunners and one pilot. They had enough pilots, but they didn't have enough gunners. So we all resigned and went to gunnery school in uh, Boca Raton, Florida. And we were trained in B-24s, the old smoking B-24s, almost choked to death on those. <laughs> I mean, uh, they, were, they were something, but... Well, tell us about that. What do you mean they almost choked you to death? Well, they were, <coughs> they were so unstabilized, I'm going to say, that we had to go into Bomb Bay and sit on a track through the Bomb Bay to get the weight about the same, and the smoke when they took off would all come into Bomb Bay. And you go, <laughs> we're coughing our head off. But uh, we, we trained at, went to gunnery school there for a number of months. And uh, that once I graduated from gunnery school uh, as uh, gunners, uh, we were shipped to Lincoln, Nebraska to be crewed up on the B-29s. They were crewing up a whole bunch of crews. And that's how I met my crew with the, uh, uh, in fact, I have a picture here of, your, of the B-29s, because uh, on the B-29s there we had three, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 3, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. We had 11 crew members on a B-29. And, uh, uh, and which one are you in that photo? Well, in this photo, I'm the youngest. I'm a teenager, 19, right down here at the bottom uh, corner here. I was 19 years old at that time. Everybody was older. Anybody that was 23 or 25 was an old guy. And uh, so that's how I met all these guys in the crew, and we were crew 236. And we had our picture taken there by uh, a nice B-29 and crew 637. And why did they use 637 instead of your usual crew plane? It's the picture on the 637, <laughs> on the 637 that they decided that to take all the pictures of the crews down there. So the, the nose art was a little more attractive. <laughs> yes, that, that's it. There, it says there, take it off, and she had most of it off. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's my memory of the crew, and and we had eleven eleven took eleven crewmen for B twenty nine. Well, uh, were you trained for any specific position on the B twenty nine? Yeah, you had a, you had a, everybody had a specific job. The B-29, as you know, was the first pressurized aircraft. The front part of the airplane was pressurized with the pilot, co-pilot, the engineer, and the bombardier, and the navigator, and, and and then you had the bomb bay, where they could put all the bombs and the atomic bombs too, and then the center portion was a separate. Uh, pressurized unit where we kept all the gunners except me, a tail gunner. They had the side gunners, the top gunners, and the bottom gunners, and a radar man. And between the two pressurized compartments was a stainless steel tube about this big around and uh, about 30 feet long. And you could go through the tube from one pressurized compartment in front to the one in the middle. Were you able to walk or did you have to crawl through there? You, you could crawl through there. It was nice and slick. It was a beautiful stainless steel. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, you remember what uh, the, the guy said uh, when they tested to see what would happen if it depressurized the first compartment? Uh, he used to get his fellow Vic Billick. He used to, he was part of getting a B-29 in shape to go into production, and he said he used to go up in the airplane and he'd go in and sleep in the tunnel. And uh, somebody said, what happens if the front compartment depressurizes when you're at 35,000 feet? You're going to go shot out of there like a cannon. So they did a test. They did a dummy in there and, and, and actually pulled a test on that thing. And that dummy went right out through the front nose of the airplane like a rocket. 
So he said, after that, uh, they put two hammocks in the B-29 in the middle compartment that we could go lay down on a long flight or sleep uh, also. And uh, to get to the tail, well, I saw back there all alone, there's a bulkhead from the middle one that crawled through a bunch of generators and all kind of trash that it needed to run a B-29 and get to the tail compartment, which was the very back end and had its own bulkhead. I crawled through there in a fold-down seat and sitting there, and the windows were just shoulders wide. I could only move a, you know, a couple inches like that. And these had, uh, you know, uh, gun sights that were automatic instead of be, have to be out in the open. And uh, you, as the airplane came in, you had a gun sight like this that you kept him in the, in the, in the, the side of the circle till he got close enough and then you could fire at him. And, and this was all photographed and everything. If you, hit the, if you hit the guy coming in on training, there would be a big red light in the nose of the uh, TAC fighter plane that would light up. So you could tell like, it was like a ping pong deal. If you hit him, hit him in the wing and stuff, the red light would go on. And then the next day you could see how many times you hit it. And that's the way they rated and graded uh, gunnery students. In the, in the tail, we had a 250 caliber machine guns and a, 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 what was it, a 50 millimeter cannon. That's the only plane that ever had a cannon on it. And to my knowledge, nobody ever hit anybody with that cannon, but the Japanese were scared to death of coming up behind the B-29s. So was that, did that cannon uh, rotate or swivel, uh, well, or did it just fire straight ahead? No, you could swivel and stuff, uh, All right. but it was more of a scare tac tactics for the Japanese. They knew there was a cannon in there, and they wouldn't come up behind you very much. Well, you're sitting back there in your, in your chair in the, in the tail gun compartment. Did you have a, uh, a parachute on? Well, absolutely. We well, how are you going to get out? If you get attacked and something happens to the airplane, how are you going to get out of that tail gun? Do you have to climb back through the, all the material you climbed no, through? The, the, the way we were trained to get out was uh, on my right side was a window about three feet in diameter that could be unhinged and thrown out. And you had to get out of there. And I don't know with a parachute how easy it would be to get out of that thing. And I always hoped that I uh, wouldn't have to jump. But that's how you got out. At least you wouldn't hit anything on the airplane because you're way behind the airplane. Guys up front would jump through the wheel well, and uh, good luck, good luck. It was a, a safe place. You, if you could get out of the tail window, you'd be okay. Did you have any practice jumping? Uh, yeah, we were trained uh, on towers uh, for parachute jumping. You'd go way up the top of this tower and you'd hook on there and you'd let you run down there and they'd trip you and you had to learn how to fall without breaking your neck in the sand. They had nice sand there stuff. And when they do that, I'd say, boy, I hope we have to jump today. This is fun. Then when we got to 35,000 feet, I changed my opinion 100%. I'd look out the window and say, no way. But do you think you could have gotten out of that uh, window with your pack on? Yeah, I, I think so. I think so because uh, I, I'm sure that they had tested that and stuff. But, you know, you had all, all kind of gear on and a parachute and stuff. They had a lot of things that could get hooked. And if you jumped out of the wheel well, well you wouldn't allow to wear a ring at all. Because if you, there's sharp steel and everything in those, and everything like that. So, uh, it, it was. Uh, I, I'm sure I would have got out if I had to get out. Well, you you're all dressed up. Uh, what's what's this outfit that you have on? This was a, my flight suit. Is that uh, your flight suit? Yes, this is my flight suit, and I haven't worn it, uh, but once or twice uh, when I go to. You know, by, to give a lecture or something like that, I would put this on and, it, and it, it still fits me. It's the same one that I had uh, 73 years ago. It fit me, so okay. I weigh 150 pounds in high school, I weigh 150 pounds now, and I never changed. 
so I just pull it out and put it on <laughs> and it still work. But I had to polish my wings a little bit because they were pretty dark. <laughs> so you, you pointed to that a couple of times. What is that? Um, what is that? that? That's a gunner's wings. When you finish gunnery school, you get your, your, those wings. Okay. Just like uh, you know, any other trade in service, you get them. Uh, uh, what's the what's the uh, well? Th this is just a metal of top. observer's wings. Anybody that flew in B-29s got a pair of those as an observer. And uh, this is a small pair of what I got on here, and this is from the VFW. Okay. Type of thing, and uh, so I don't know what else. Well, what I've tell tell me about uh, the progression of your rank when you uh, when you were enlisted. Uh, what rank were you? Well, you you enlisted. Was everybody's a private when they enlist? All right, in the Air Force. Yeah, in the Air Force. And then, what was your progression? Uh, after we got out of gunnery school, you got, I was a corporal. And as you saw on here, the other guys were all sergeants because they were older, had been around longer, and, and uh, so forth. But uh, I got in late, but so be it. I always wanted to be a pilot, but uh, never got there because of uh, the war was about over. And uh, so I was lucky. Uh, I think the atomic bomb might have saved me because we were headed to put Tokyo and Japan on fire with all our B-29s. I was surprised to learn that uh, we manufactured uh, 4,792 B-29s. That's a tremendous bunch of B-29s. How we were many were they going to send over to uh, Tokyo? As many as they could get out there. Uh, just hordes of them. And where were they going to fly from? Uh, Guam and Tinian, island of Tinian. That's where the guys took off for the, the tower, dropped the atomic bombs. Well, did you ever did you ever get to do any training as a pilot? No, I never, uh, not, not officially. I used to get up front there and fly it when the guys got tired or I'd b bug them. <laughs> and what plane was that? Did, uh, they let B-29. You B-29? Yeah, B-29. I, yeah, I'd go up there at times for hours and sit there and fly that thing because they didn't have any automatic pilots or anything in those days. Um, you just had to fly the sucker. I tried to talk them in to let me land it one day and they kicked me out of there. Because <laughs> I thought I could by that time. So your only experience in a B-24 was in gunnery school? Yeah. And where was that? In a Boca Raton, Boca Raton. Florida, I don't know. How long was that? How long was it? Yeah, how long was your gunnery training? Oh, only a couple months. I think it was like 90 days or something like that. Did yeah. you have any, during this period of time, did you have any leaves to go home uh, after enlistment or when yeah, you were transferring I, from one uh, station yeah. to another? Yeah, like when I got out of gunnery school, I went home for a leave. And then I, after I leave, I went to Lincoln, Nebraska to crew up. And while we were in the Clovis, New Mexico, is where we did all our B-29 training, uh, I went home once for a, a furlough. So that's, at that time, there was a lot of transportation by train, too, yet. Is that how you got home? Yeah, uh, certainly. And. Uh, then when we went over overseas uh, uh, to go get airplanes back, uh, we took the train to San Francisco and, and then uh, took the boat to Hawaii and then bring back to E-29s. I made that trip a few times. All right. Now, was that after the war was over? Yeah, after the war was over, they, they had to bring back all this stuff. All where, this. Where'd they put them? We, took, uh, we landed at Fairfield Susan Air Base in Sacramento from Hawaii, and then we took them to uh, Ogden, Utah, based in Ogden, Utah, and we uh, stayed there for a while, and then they said, uh, okay. Then we flew them to Oklahoma City, and uh, I don't know why, because they all ended up at uh, Kingman, Arizona, in the desert. Uh, they got nose to tail thousands of them out there just and they're still there 
That's out near Tucson, is it? Kingman? Tucson or Phoenix? It's it's up uh, closer to Las Vegas. Okay. Uh, Kingman, Arizona is a big flat desert out there, and they took all the uh, armament and airplanes and tanks and put them out there because it's so dry that they wouldn't rust. And that that's been a salvage yard for the last 75 years. <laughs> <laughs> they're not going to need them again either, are they? <laughs> no, no, they're not going to need them again. But uh, they can use them for parts and whatever. But it, uh, that was a big expensive war to build all that stuff and then suddenly didn't need any of it. So, so how close were you to being deployed over to uh, fly into Tokyo? Well, we were on orders to go to Guam when they dropped an atomic bomb. Now, how many days was that before they dropped the bomb? Well, we had we had got orders, oh, probably a month before, and we were getting all packed up and getting ready to take our whole wing out to Guam. And uh, I got hung up in Hawaii, and half of them went to Guam, uh, and they just shut everything down when they dropped the atomic bomb. It was all over. Well, that, that makes me uh, think to ask you a question. Do you remember Pearl Harbor, when Pearl Harbor happened? Oh, I sure do. Yeah. Um, I was still in high school when Pearl Harbor happened. And what, what did you think of it? What did your classmates think of it? What did they think of me? No, the, no, the, the uh, bombing of Pearl Harbor, what, what was the thought that went through you? Well, I think at that time uh, everybody was shocked. Everybody was shocked and, and I think most of all my class went in the service also. All right. And some of them got shot up pretty bad. Well, um, after Pearl Harbor and before you enlisted, uh, uh, your dad was still farming? Yes. And uh, did you have to do anything special as, as far as rationing food or well, anything like that? Yeah, on a farm, you know, they ration gasoline and you could get gasoline to, for your tractors to farm. And then, uh, I really shouldn't say this, but everybody else did it. it we put it in a car and had gasoline for our car if you got short of uh, gasoline. How about rubber for cars or tractor tires? Uh, they didn't have tractor warm rubber tires at that time. They had big cleats. Uh, those steel, 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 steel cleated? Steel cleats, yeah. yeah. So did you help on the farm? Sure did. I'd drive the tractor when I was 11 years old. We'd drive the tractor and plow and plow corn and sit out there all day and with horses. We had horses. In fact, we got our first tractor just about the time the war started. And I remember he paid $500 for the tractor. Boy, that was exorbitant. What what model was it or what brand? Farmall. Farmall? We had an old Farmall. And uh, that took the place of a lot of horses and stuff. And we left home. What, uh, um, how many acres we had was your farm? We had 100 acres with farming with horses. And when my brother and I went to the service, you know, had nobody to help him, sold the farm and became a carpenter. All right. Uh, he was a carpenter the rest of his life, and a good one too. So did he work on his own or did he work for a company? Oh, there's a couple guys all worked together. They just had do modernization work and stuff like that. How old was your dad when he passed away? Eighty-three. How about your mom? Fifty-five. She had a stroke. Oh. And my dad remarried and had almost got another twenty-five. She, so, so he had two wives. Okay. All right. So um, how did you get the news that you were no longer wanted by Uncle Sam? Well, I'm, I'm trying to trying to remember. I guess the critical time was when I refused to drop the third atomic bomb. They, they sent us back to the States and we ferried airplanes back in. And uh, when we flew the last one to Oklahoma City, they said, okay, you're done. 
And so well, I got the word in Oklahoma City that I was no longer needed in the service and went back to Fort Benjamin Harrison and got discharged. Honorable discharge. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about the, the atomic bombs. Um, where were you physically when they dropped the first bomb? I was downtown Clovis, New Mexico. We were on a weekend leave going downtown where we had to, the, the big airfield was right outside of uh, Clovis. And we were downtown Clovis and the MPs came by with speakers saying, everybody in uniform back to the base. And they made everybody go back to the base at Clovis uh, when they got word that they had dropped atomic bomb. All right. Was there any rumors or scuttlebutt about there going to be a dropping of the bomb no. before they actually did? No, that was a complete surprise to everybody. Colonel Tebbets knew it, most of the crew didn't even know it. That they had a special flight going. So they, they, it was the Enola Gay that took the first bomb? Yeah, the Enola Day and, and Colonel Tibbets was the pilot. And uh, they took off at 2.45 in the morning and, and uh, went up to Hiroshima and dropped the first atomic bomb. How big was that bomb? It weighed 10,000 pounds and it was about uh, 10 feet long. It was, it was Little Boy. They nicknamed it Little Boy and everybody signed up the atomic bomb of the crew and uh, they dropped it at from 35,000 feet and uh, the eventual death down there was like a quarter of a million people. But they killed 140,000 on that first day, and uh, and from radiation they got another 100,000. So officially, I think they have said it's 240,000 people were killed uh, by dropping that first bomb, which went off at 1,925 feet altitude, which is the date of my birth, 1925, <laughs> and. Uh, it just created, for one complete mile in diameter, it vaporized even steel. Just ruined the whole town. That, that was the first one. Well, what about, what about the uh, concussion of the explosion? What, what effect did well, you hear the head on the uh, Enola Gay? Well, the Enola Gay and their crowd, uh, they were very concerned about what would happen when uh, a shock wave hit them. They were at 35,000 feet, and that when they dropped the bomb, they immediately turned 90 degrees and headed for Tinian. And uh, it took, uh, I forget how long, something like 45 seconds for the shock wave to hit them. And, and during that very day, it got maybe 25 miles away. The shock wave hit them and tossed them around like a, a piece of paper. And they, but uh, the plane held together and they were able to fly. But it really, really rocked them terribly. That shock wave. Uh, so, because we didn't know nothing about those atomic bombs, what it would do to airplanes, or what it would do to anybody, except it'd be devastating. And that was a, uh, I believe that was a, that was a. What kind of bomb was it? It was a hydrogen. It, no. Where's my note? One of them, one of them was a uh, plutonium. Pl one of them was a, the second one was, was plutonium. One in Nagasaki. Now, first one was a uranium. All right. First one was a uranium. There. So the second bomb was a plutonium bomb. Well, I've, as a youngster and later in life, I've heard that uh, even after the first atomic bomb uh, went off, that the Japanese still were not. Uh, uh, going to surrender. What can you tell us yeah, of your knowledge? The information I got back was that uh, they said you only got one of them, and uh, so we're not going to surrender. So three days later, on August the 9th, uh, the boxcar took off. Major Bach flying the boxcar took off for Kukura, which is a big town uh, that made a lot of ships and was a uh, uh, manufacturing of war material and then and uh, they had to wait a half hour for the planes that 
was going to photograph all of this stuff for the for photograph planes, and then they did three bypasses on Kukur. It was socked in tight. Of course, they were under instructions that uh, they could not drop the atomic bomb unless they visually saw the t city and the target, even though they had radar. And uh, so after three passes and waiting for the planes, they're getting low on fuel, and so they went their secondary target, uh, Nagasaki. This all precipitated to this day. They say in Japan, you got the luck of Kohur. That became a common thing because they were going to drop it on Kokura and they were weathered in. So when they got to Nagasaki, it was fogged in again and with clouds and stuff. But of course, with radar, they could see the city. And uh, as, uh, as the rumors go, as they did the sec uh, pass on Nagasaki uh, with the crew being under orders that you can't drop it unless you see it. The navigator, uh, bombardier, bombardier screamed, I see it, I see it, I see it. And the pilot opened the bomb bay doors and they dropped the sucker right on the plant that made all the torpedoes for Hawaii. And of course Nagasaki has a big hill in the middle of it. It's kind of a divided city topography-wise. And the blast killed 80,000 people and the, and the rest of it went over the hill or so it didn't do the whole town. They got only 80,000 of the people, but to this day nobody knows whether he saw it or not. Uh, they all believe that he, the pilot said, I'm not taking this thing back home. I'll try to land the airplane with an atomic bomb in it. And uh, that's why the bombardier hollered, I see it, I see it. So to this day nobody knows if he saw it or not. Since uh, these guys are all dying, you know, nobody will ever know. Well, what uh, what about the shockwave from the from the second one? What was it, what was the name they gave that second bomb? Oh, the, the second boy was Fat Boy. Fat Boy was about ten feet long. It was a totally different uh, configuration of the of the first bomb, and it was a plutonium bomb. And uh, there's no discussion that I ever heard of what happened as, but about the shockwave bothering the airplane. He just took off and kept going, and uh, survived. He survived it, and but they went. Uh, they they had been waited so long uh, to go to the alternate target and waiting for the photo planes and stuff that when they left uh, Nagasaki, the flight engineer says we got enough fuel for 150 miles, and it's 220 miles to. Uh, What's the island out there? I'm trying to think of it that they were going to land on uh, the Japanese island. So they had 150 miles worth of fuel, and they had 220 miles. So they start throwing everything out of the airplane, but the people. I mean, they took everything out, and uh, as they neared they neared uh, the airport down there in southern Japan, uh, they were screaming, "Mayday! Mayday! Mayday!" And all the guys in the tower were having coffee at the restaurant. Nobody answered. And so they took a direct flight to the uh, landing area. And uh, as they're on the final leg, one engine stopped. No more fuel. And just as they're touching down, another air engine stopped. And uh, they taxied in the runway and shut her down. And, uh, they later checked and they had seven gallon of fuel, which is not enough to taxi to the <laughs> get some more fuel. So the guys all went to the restroom and cleaned up and <laughs> and uh, they had something to eat and refuel and went back to Tinian. Well, um, that's how close they were to being, uh, you know, crashing or having to bail out. Well, th didn't they have a reserve tank? Yeah, they had a reserve tank of 600 gallon of fuel. But the pump didn't work. <laughs> they, they couldn't use it. The pump was defective. And so that was a close one. But yeah. uh, that's just little nuances of a, how things went then. Because even when they sent the first atomic bomb to Tinian with uh, no instructions or manuals how to put it in the airplane or what to do with it, so they got very. In, uh, Ingenious, and they figured out what to do 
as guys are at a young age. They dug a big hole and put the atomic bomb down in the hole, and they backed the airplane over the hole and just used ropes and pulleys to put the damn atomic bomb in the bomb bay, into the bomb bay. That's on the first one? That's on the first one. And then the, the, I don't know about the second one. They probably heard about it or things like that, but that's some of the little off the beat stories about you know how that went. You know, it was such a big operation to kill a quarter of a million people, and you got to figure out how to put the bomb in the bomb bay. So, well, you mentioned it. you mentioned uh, you declined the opportunity to go on a trip for a third bomb. Yeah, uh, after the second bomb, they went to the Japanese again and said, "Hey, surrender." They said. Uh, Nope, we aren't going to surrender. You don't have another one. You only got two of them. So our negotiators went over there with pictures and stuff of the third atomic bomb and said, we not only got a third one, the next one's coming down a smoke pipe in Tokyo where you live. And they surrendered. I mean, they said, we're going to drop the next one right down in Tokyo. And then that's when they surrendered. And so they did have, we did have a third one. and. <coughs> I guess uh, they did, did a pretty smart thing, got together and said, hey, what are we going to do with this thing? We don't know anything about the atomic bomb as to what it does when it explodes on the ground and what the results are and stuff. We got a third one. So what they wound up doing was they, they said, okay, let, let's take, find an island and that we can drop this thing on and put all old tanks and old ships and airplanes and stuff around and put meters and gauges on everything that we can really get some uh, information on it and see where the radiation goes and how much radiation it's got and things like that. And uh, so they picked the island of Bikini, which had resident, uh, 425 residents on the island. That was a nice little island. That's all the people that lived there. And they uprooted them and moved them all to another island for uh, about couple hours away in the Marshall Islands so that there were no people there. And then they took a lot of the old ships and planes and and tanks and whatever you got, put it on that island as an experimental deal to drop the third atomic bomb. And most people that today, if I mention that to them, they don't even know there was a third atomic bomb. And uh, so they dropped it down there and got a good reading on everything. And unfortunately, the atomic radiation cloud went from the island, they moved these people from 400 miles downwind where they had put them. <laughs> By that time it was relatively weak and it didn't uh, seriously affect them. But that's what the third atomic bomb was. And I was in Hawaii and one day one guy came up to me and said, hey, you want to volunteer for this project? And he explained it to me. And I said, absolutely not. There's two things. One, I want to go home. Two, I'm scared to death of that damn thing. And I don't trust the government from to hey, why don't you fly at 10,000 feet and see if it knocks you out of the sky? That kind of stuff went through my mind that they did that kind of stuff. And so I went home, but that was my scrape with fame, was to, to drop the third atomic bomb. And so then I went, went home. So what uh, what was your rank when you uh, retired from the corporal? Uh, corporal, still yeah, a corporal. I, I was at the bottom of the bottom of the pile. I was at the bottom of the pile, but if I'd have been in two years younger, I saw full colonels at twenty five. Yeah, yeah. and uh, you know, another you know another little tidbit that uh, isn't isn't known is a. Uh, when the B-29s were first tested, the first ones coming off the line and so forth, uh, Colonel Tibbets was in charge of uh, seeing that plane to production. And the B-29, some of the first ones, they were, had a habit of catching on fire. A number of them burned and people got killed. And uh, in fact, the, there were a number of pilots refused to fly the B-29 because it was the flying fireplace that would get fire on it, catch from fire. So Colonel Tibbets, uh, to 
cure the thing while they were curing it. He said, I'll get me a couple of test pilots to fly these B-29s, four-engine giants, and uh, we'll get through this. We'll find out what it is. And who did he pick for test pilots? Two women that never flown the B-4 engine airplane before. And I think it was uh, Dorothea Mormon and uh, who was the other lady? Dora Doherty? He picked, yeah, he, he, he picked uh, two women to be the test pilots, Dora Doherty and Dorothea Mormon had never flown a four-engine plane, and these two women test, float, test flew the B-29s through the whole thing, and they, they got it corrected and it stopped burning and things like that, and the, the pilots finally figured that these women can fly that damn thing, and it's safe, we'll go back and we'll fly it. So they sort of had a pilot strike on this thing, because the, the first ones were catching on fire, probably from uh, batteries or electric, electrical stuff, and, they got it all corrected, but it's sure interesting that he picked two women to, to fly the a test pilot, the B-29, and get it through to production. And I think those two gals should go in the Hall of Fame. <laughs> well, it, it, you brought a photograph, and <coughs> what's this photograph of? Is oh yeah, this is this is a photograph of the crew that uh, that uh, were the test people on the B-29. Here's the two ladies right there. They were uh, the two girls that test flew the B-29s to make sure that they, they could keep safe. They'd make modifications and stuff and they'd fly the airplane, the two two ladies. And uh, they should be in the Hall of Fame, I think, because finally, you know, the B-29 was considered safe and didn't catch on fire and then uh, the pilots agreed to fly them again. Now they're, the, they're in front of a uh, uh, plane that's titled La oh, Lady, Lady Bird. Bird. Yeah, Lady, <laughs> Lady Bird. Is that the one they test, test flew, do you know? I don't, I don't know if that is true, whether that's uh, a test pilot <coughs> or not, but that, that sure was a quirky little thing that he would go out of his way to go to the, the Women Pilots Association and pick two women to fly because the men wouldn't fly it. So that, that was very interesting. And it became a very, very safe airplane. Never had any trouble with it. Well, um, have you had any near misses in any of the uh, airplanes that you have been a passenger in? Well, I'll tell you, tell you about the one I told you this morning that we were on a a long-range mission flight to Cleveland, Ohio from Clovis and on the way back I'm sitting back there in the tail and all at once a big piece of metal comes flying by there. I said, what the hell is that? And so I got on the radio right away and I got the answer. Uh, a six by ten sheet of the fuselage is flowing off. <laughs> and it went sailing by so they cut down to minimum flying speed with it, and we limped home okay, but that it was a big shock to me to see that big piece of metal come flying by. So what happens to the pressurization of the aircraft with that sheet metal gone? It was by the Bombay. Now, speaking of that, you know, I told you about the test of, of uh, the front compartment depressurizing, and it happened one day. We were up to 35,000 feet, and the valve blew out, and we went from 35,000 feet down to 800, about, well, down to ground zero in less than 30 seconds. Boy, my ears went, <laughs> they just crack and pop. Didn't blow my ears out, but some of them got their ears hurt. It went from 35,000 feet, or reverse it. It went, it went, it went to, yeah, from 35,000 feet down to nothing. I mean, it was. Well, what it caused was, what a valve? A valve blew, the pressurized valve blew. Oh man! Boy, I can remember that yet. My ears popped and crackled like you can't believe. Changing pressure from thirty-five thousand or from a ground level up to thirty-five thousand feet, where the pressure is very low. Yeah. yeah. 
Well, when you when you get out of the service uh, and you come back to Fort uh, Fort Harrison and then you come home, what did you do? I none of my family ever went to college. I took the GI Bill of Rights and and, and uh, signed up for the University of Dayton, and I after four years I got a mechanical engineering degree and and. Uh, I would have gone, never got to go, go to college if it wasn't for the GI Bill. Well, I know that uh, you, you went into the Air Force because your older brother uh, was already a, a pilot, uh, but why did you go into engineering when you had a chance to go to college? I'm not sure why I chose mechanical engineer, but you know, you go to school for a year or two before you decide what you're going to specialize in, and I, I decided I wanted to be in you know, uh, mechanical engineer, which uh, I did. So when did you graduate from UD? 1950. And you were married by that time? I got married in 1949. Uh, my GI Bill kept me in school for three years, and then I married a girl that was working to get me through the fourth <laughs> year. <laughs> and so that that turned out pretty good. And, and she was uh, she was a nurse at yeah, that she time? Yeah, she was an RN. And they didn't get paid very well, but any money was good money. Yeah. Uh, so when did you start having children? We, let's see, we got we got married in 1949, uh, and shortly thereafter we had Nancy and and Cindy, and then Doug. Uh, so and, Na and, uh, Nancy's 69, and Cindy's 66, and Doug is 62. Yes, yeah, so he's still uh, still president of Powers and Sons has been for, he's been there some 23 years and he's been president for like 15 years. What does uh, that company do? They're up in um, Bryan, Ohio, way up in the northwest corner of uh, Ohio in Williams County and they make uh, steering components for the automotive industry, the, for Tesla and Ford and General Motors and Chrysler. They make steering components and, and uh, they got a factory there, they got about 400 500 people employed in Bryan, Ohio. Did he go to college? Yes, he did. Where did he go? University of Toledo, and he's a mechanical engineer. Right. And his son Leo is a mechanical engineer. And uh, it's in so the blood, huh? Uh, <laughs> it works. So, uh, what is Nancy? Is Nancy married? Yeah, she she married to us. She went to college at Ohio U, and never came back. She's now, what's married, her married, married name? down there. What's her married name? Nancy Merriman, M-E-R-R-I-M-A-N, Merriman. Where, where does she live? She lives and still lives down there in the Athens, Athens area. Yeah, been there all her life. Yeah, uh, how about Cindy? Uh, yeah. She go to college? Yes, she did. She went to Bowling Green University and got a degree in, uh, in uh, human services. Is she married? She, she, she got married. Uh, and uh, that lasted about four years, and then she got a divorce. And but uh, she finally found a good fireman in Columbus, Ohio, and he's a he's a medical technician. And she wor she was in New Jersey, uh, and got a job with a I, I forget the name, but it was a medical company that provides prescription drugs, and it was a young company. If I mentioned you will hear because they were, they were bought by Merck. So when she was there, uh, they got paid moderately, but it gave them a lot of options. And when Merck bought the company, they become Merck options, and it became very valuable. And so she really came out of that in, in good shape. And she now lives in uh, Sunbury, Ohio, just outside of Columbus, got 100 acres. Two bass lakes. I was up there this weekend catching bass, uh, and uh, so she was very successful because she ended up with <coughs> going to Merck. Well, did she marry the fireman? Yeah. And what's her last name? Her la oh, she's now a, a Cindy Belcher, B E L C H E R Belcher. And he's re he's retired too now. Do you have grandchildren? Yeah, they got two children. One of them uh, is a child, and uh, one they adopted from Russia. Now, is that Cindy we're talking about? Yeah, Cindy. 
Yeah, they, they they got married, uh, you know, in their 40s, and uh, they decided to adopt a child, and they got a child from Russia, 125 miles northwest of, of uh, that was the capital of Russia. St. Petersburg? No, it's Moscow? Uh, huh? Moscow? Uh, yeah, 25 miles northwest of Moscow, and uh, they, they uh, adopted a little boy, and by the time he was 15, he had his pilot license. He's now into Columbus working, and uh, so that they have two children. The other one is a uh, an officer at the, the State Bank in Boston. Okay. The other son. How about Nancy? Does she have children? No, no children. Doug? He have horses. Children? They got horses. Horses. <laughs> How about Doug? Does he have children? Yeah, he has uh, two boys. Uh, one of them, as I mentioned, is Leo, the mechanical engineer. And he's been for nine, ye nine years already with uh, AOE, their big design corporation for factories and things like that. And uh, he's already a certified, goes all over the country to see that the job's put in the way they designed it. And uh, so he's doing good. In fact, we were just up there and he, he bought a nice home in Toledo and he has a great grandson. Oh, good. His name's Benson. Benson. Yep, name Benson. So Benson Carlton Link. Sounds like a count. Somebody says sound like a legal firm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, you began working at uh, Air Temp? No. Yeah. I Nas National Sales and Manager for Chrysler Air Temp. Yeah, I, I went uh, out of college to Chrysler Air Temp and uh, got in our executive training program or, or whatever you call it, and eventually it was sent to Philadelphia for. Nine years where all our children were born in, in Philadelphia, and uh, and I went back to factory and kept moving up. After about 18 years, I was national sales manager for that division in the United States. And during that period, I had a lot of customers that you know I was in sales, primarily in sales of, of customers around the United States that I knew, and. At that time, the stock market was everybody wanted to go public. No, let's go public and get stock. And so these guys were all individual company owners or entrepreneurs in their own right. And they thought, why don't we all, a bunch of them knew each other through the association, why don't we all get together and merge our companies all together and go public? So, geez, that's a hell of a good idea. So they all got together, 10 of them, 10 companies. They were in Wichita, Kansas City, Florida, New Jersey, and uh, Indianapolis, Cincinnati, and Dayton. And they all got together and merged their companies. And they come and got me as president because they all, most of them knew me from, uh, I was a factory man and they were our just customers. So. We formed a company called Airtron, A-I-R-T-R-O-N, and uh, we we went the route of making a. Co I had to make a corporation out of ten individual entrepreneurs. That's why I don't have any hair, much, and they're all gray. What's left? Uh, I mean, I should have wrote a book because that's an unbelievable task to try to take individual entrepreneurs whose wife has a company car, and the sons say. You know, they got this and, and uh, 10 different companies and put them together and make a corporation out of them. It took me 10 years to get this thing all together. And a lot of them, you know, died, some retired. And, and uh, so what, what they find, what we finally did is we sold the company to Arco, which is an old Atlantic Richfield Oil Company. And they're big on the West Coast. They got their headquarters on the West Coast, uh, Arco. Uh, big oil and gas company, sold it to them because they were fiddling around not only with oil and gas but solar power. They had a big solar power division up in California and they thought that this company which was heating and air conditioning, all these entrepreneurs, 
would be just a thing for to install solar stuff and, and make solar a big fashionable hit. And uh, so that's why they that's why they bought Airtron, and, and I became vice president of Arco and ran not only Airtron but some of their other division. San Francisco they had Aquionics, who would make water purification uh, systems and stuff like that. And so I stayed there uh, till I retired in at 60 years of, of age. I retired in 1985. I retired from there, and then they. Arco was bought by British Petroleum, so Arco now is a division of British Petroleum, and Chrysler is owned by Fiat in Italy. So I get my retirement from Fiat in Italy and Ar uh, British Petroleum in England. <laughs> so that that sort of was uh, my career. Of, uh, that was very very interesting. I tell you. Uh, to try to make a corporation out of ten individual companies. But I did it. While we were coming down here, you told me about a couple of instances where you were in airplanes and you had some landing uh, oh. landing issues. Yeah, in one month time I had to land uh, commercial airliners that had tires falling. <laughs> uh, going flying to Cleveland one day, I, I was a regional manager in Chicago, and. Uh, Flying to Cleveland and they blew a tire on takeoff. We had to land with a uh, blown tire and he landed it okay, oh good. And a uh, month later, my wife and I went to uh, to Italy and uh, with a bunch of customers. We went to Italy and on the way home we stopped at Madrid to refuel. And on takeoff, he's humming down the runway and all once everything went blah blah blah. I said he blew a tire and he never said a word. Nobody. Knew he blew a tire, but I don't think but me. I so I just had it happen. I know what it sounds like and what it feels like. And we get about to New York, and he says, I <clears throat> got some bad news. He said, We blew a tire on takeoff, so you better all get your head down between your knees and stuff. And we're going to try to land this thing. And uh, he, had, he kept it on one wheel for long enough so that he slowed down when you finally put the other wheel down. It, it shook like mad, but it it held together and they come out with a bus and got us off of there and said, oh boy, I don't want any more of that stuff. So, but I'm still alive, I'm still here. So, uh, you've been retired since 85? Yeah, since 85. I did a little uh, management consulting with a couple companies around Dayton uh, off and on. And, uh, and then I spent eight years at the University of Dayton as a, a moderator for the senior business entrepreneur class at the University of Dayton for eight years. And that, w that was a very a lot of fun and very interesting type of thing. Well, how many, how many days a week did you do that? Well, <clears throat> we had class one night a week and then uh, uh, the seniors entrepreneur class, you, you got, let's say, five students. I had, I, they assigned five students to me, and they picked a company around Dayton as a, t as a project, as a project. And the, so the five entrepreneurial students, seniors, would go in there with me moderating them to see what you could do to fix a company or help them uh, improve their management and their sales and everything like that. So it was a project for the senior entrepreneur class and I had to moderate them. Oh, you can't do that or you, you know, I'd, I'd be with them. During the week we'd go have meetings with the company. Well, who said you couldn't do it? Well, if they wanted to do something that I, I from my experience, didn't think they should do, oh. I'd say, no, you don't want to do that. Okay. You know, do, do, I don't think you want to do that. And so. That was very interesting. I did that for eight years till I was uh, in my 80s, and then I gave it up. But that that was very very interesting uh, thing to do to have him in class. Then we'd help when we had class during the week. Uh, at times we'd we did make presentations. There was probably eight or nine of us moderators or you know mentors mentors, and we all got to 
make presentations and stuff. And I had a lot of fun with that because I, I like to talk. <laughs> and, and I had you know, good spirits. And, you know, and the biggest thing I'd do was uh, really you know, to, to shock them because you got a lot, a lot of kids don't know what the hell they're going to do in their senior class and stuff. And they all got sad stories or good stories. And I'd get up there and I'd spin around and say, I got good news for you tonight. Oh, yeah? I said, yeah. You're completely in charge of who you become. And that goes for every one of you. You're in charge of who you become. Don't blame it on your parents or don't blame it on your relatives. Nothing, because you make thousands of decisions every day. And eventually, you become, it, it's up to you. And I drilled that into their head that, you know, hey, what you become, it's up to you, nobody else. So that was an interesting time. Some companies that we had as experiment went broke, <laughs> and then a lot of other ones prospered. Uh -huh. Good in there, because I had a lot of business experience, and, uh, and uh, the company owners most of the time were uh, interested in perhaps outside thinking. And at the end of the semester, the business owner had to come in to the university to a conference room and my five kids would make a formal presentation of what they recommend he should do or could do or should give him consideration of what he might do. And uh, that, that was very, very, very interesting. The, the most of the entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs uh, look forward to the uh, suggestions of the, of the students? Yeah, most of them were very fav most of them were very favorable because during a semester which is like four months or three or four months, you got well acquainted with him and all his people and stuff like that that you could you, you were comfortable at least making suggestions or something regarding that because well you know, like one company would have four owners, all equal. So you can't have four owners. Somebody's gotta be boss here. Because one they all thought different. One of them was running the inventory, one was running installation, another one was running this, and was it running accounting, and I think one of the biggest flaws was, um, of all of them was they didn't know what their cost was, and they didn't have a good accounting system. Stuff like that, and they could go through it, so that, that was an inter interesting experience for me, and they still do it at the University of Dayton. Well, good. Well, thank you, uh, Brian. I'm sure you have some questions. Oh, I've got a couple of questions. <coughs> I was wondering, your, your older brother, who's serving in the war, uh, did you keep in contact with him? Oh, yes, very closely, yes, till he died. No, I meant during the war. Was oh. he able to write letters or anything? I met him one, one time accidentally down in Mississippi in a bar <laughs> there. But I did go to visit him once. Uh, when he was in, uh, still in the uh, States, and uh, went over to Mississippi and got there five o'clock in the morning and went on the air base and found him and his buddy, and they were sleeping. And because uh, I had a three-day pass, it turned out he w he had a sore throat or something he couldn't fly, but his roommate took me up in the beat the B uh, the Volte vibrator B13. A test plane and we flew around, but that's the only time I got to see him was twice when I was in the service. Till he came, till he came home. You know. But did your family hear from him? Was he was he able to write letters that you're aware of? I wrote letters almost every day to, to home, and so he, he he did too. He tried to write home. In fact, one of our long test flights from Clovis to Cleveland. I flew right over Cranberry Prairie and St. Henry at 30,000 feet, and I could see it real well and everything. Uh, it got a big kick out of right. My parents said, hey, yesterday I was over Cranberry Prairie and St. Henry, there, and I could see, still see, uh, we called it Slinder Reservoir, but Lake St. Mary's up there. I could see that when I was over Terre Haute, Indiana from the tail. That's 250 miles away. That's how high we were, of course. 
But uh, it, that was a really an interesting thing, got to fly over my hometown. Well, I wasn't the only one. Our pilot, Captain Lamson, came from Lincoln, Nebraska. And we were up that way one day, and we, you know, at that, that time the tallest building there was about 10 stories. We came right down Main Street with flapping the wings like this and <laughs> turned around and came back and boy, the people were out on the street waving. You're not allowed to do that, but <laughs> right down Main Street, that B-29, <laughs> jeez, <laughs> about 100 feet high, <laughs> right <laughs> down the street. Oh, man. That was a kick. He said, that everybody knows who, who that was. <laughs> that was his hometown. <laughs> you know, little things like that. Uh, you got to remember, we were all pretty much teenagers and hell bent for anything and hell with the rules and hell with the directives, you know. So, when you went into the service, you were hoping to be a pilot. Yes. How far into your training did you find out you they weren't going to make you a pilot, but a, a We were at Sp Spencefield, Georgia, when they that's where they trained. We were going to train as pilots. They shut her down right, right in front of us. So, and looking back on it, you know, it might have been the best thing. But uh, that's the way it went in the war. You know, you, the orders would come down, and you have to follow. We, did you, had you had you already tested to be a gunner when you got that assignment? How did you become no. a? Nobody was. They just trained you. Mm -hmm. Nope, that was ground zero. That had nothing to do with it. Shooting 50 caliber, 50 caliber guns and cannons and everything. You know, they did, but they did a good, they did a good job there. Kept us going. And but we were all glad when the war ended. The first thought was, let's go home. Uh. You seem to be very familiar with the B-29. I mean, you served on it, but it seems like you did a lot of research on its history. Yeah, yeah, I have. Since I got out of the service, I did got a lot of research information on the, on the atomic bombs, especially, and and uh, I've spoken to a number of groups about it and and things like that. that because nobody had any details on the nitty-gritty stuff that happened on it and any of the statistics and stuff like that. So uh, that, that's really, I enjoy that. I enjoy that very much. I was, I, I, B-29 I associated as being near the end of the war. Yeah. And, and uh, obviously it was used in the, in the, uh, the, the atomic bomb droppings. But I would think they, that they were thinking of the B-29, they had that in mind when, when they had the bomb, I would think. I was wondering if you've ever, known how aware of how they were going to use the bomb and did it was the b-29 already when it was being developed was that maybe being developed with the atomic bomb in mind no i don't think so but at that time the b-29s were being developed it was the biggest more uh, bomber that was, you know flying in the air and uh, they just linked the two together because they were developing the b-29 the same time the, the manhattan project was on trying to build an atomic bomb and by the way the trigger for the atomic bombs were d designed in Dayton, Ohio in the uh, Oakwood area in a private home. Some engineers there did design the trigger mechanism to make the atomic bomb explode. Do you know how that worked, the trigger mechanism? No, I don't. Okay. <laughs> that was a pretty tough secret. How do you get this thing to go from a piece of steel and stuff to an uh, inferno that is 100 times as hot as our sun. And, it, and it's many times uh, hotter than enough to melt steel. They, they figured out how to do the trigger, and, it, and they worked. That was developed in Dayton, Ohio, in an Oakwood area. And you mentioned how each bomb was different. The first bomb was different from the second bomb. Like one used plutonium. The first one was uranium. Right. Do you know how that came about? Why did it, why did they just have one bomb with their two research teams? Do you know how why there were two different bombs yeah. using two different? That's a surprise to me too. It was a total surprise that they weren't the same. The first one was uranium, then plutonium, and uh, I have no idea how that happened. But do you, 
the third one that you mentioned that you were might have been part of. Do you know which one that was? No, I don't. Yeah. I, I don't know whether that was a uranium or plutonium or what that water was, but uh, you know, I often thought well, I should have gone and done that, but your whole perspective at that age and your mentality at that age had a whole different setting than it is now in afterthought. Because that, that might have been cool to have done that, but uh, at that time it was a it was a no doubter. I'm going home because the fright from those bomb and all the literature and the, and the information that was put out on it just scared to death. We didn't know what that all that radiation would do. Was it going to kill all these people years later? How strong was it? Where does it go? And how long can you wait to? Re rehabilitate an area and stuff. I mean, everything was scare, frightful, and uh, that's why I, no, no, no I'm not going to be a test pig. And now you've done presentations on the B-29 and the atomic bomb. Yeah. So how did you started doing that, and who do you, who who have you done presentations to? Uh, what audiences? I th I think maybe in internally I've I felt that. Uh, that might have saved my butt from getting killed, you know, because we were on our way to bomb Tokyo to the ground or invade it with a couple hundred thousand troops at that time. And uh, I, I think that uh, that maybe was the reason that I was so interested in the atomic bomb. It, uh, you know, what it could do and stuff is frightening. It's frightening. And, uh, and so I start collecting all kind of information on it after the war was over and so forth. And uh, now most of the people <coughs> don't remember any of that stuff. The f current generation. Did, did, I'm sure you interviewed a lot of people, but most of them, if I said, say something about the third atomic bomb, they go, there's only two of them. They, they don't teach it in school or anything. That was a complete, uh, it wasn't hidden. But it was never publicized. Never publicized, I think. So how did you start doing uh, presentations on that? Because I talked about it a lot, and people say, oh, hey, well, you want to talk to the class? Or you want to talk to the American Business Club? Well, sure. Well, get a good discussion going on, I think. Yeah, because it's getting lost in history. Did you, have you heard much about it? No, not the third atomic bomb, no. Yeah, see, uh, your generation, you mentioned to them, they don't know anything about it. They say nothing about it in school teachings anymore, and I don't know why they should, but, you know, you'd think maybe they would. And I, I think they downplay the atomic bombs a whole lot, too. Let's not bother with that stuff. Do you remember where you, I think you mentioned maybe you were in Hawaii, where were you when you first heard about the atomic bomb droppings and how was it described to you? I was in downtown Clovis, New Mexico. I remember where I was on Main Street. We were probably looking for a bar or something <laughs> down there on a little leave. And, and then it comes the loudspeakers of the MPs driving down the street with speakers, all military back to the base. Uh, they just said, oh, everybody back to the base. They didn't say that the top dropped an atomic bomb. So we went back to the base wondering what the hell was going on. And so they had the information there. And what was you know, your other part of the question you had? Was well, when did you actually hear what it was about this bomb and stuff? Were you debriefed, or was it just someone casually told you, or, or on the radio? Or? Well, all this information that I have on it, I've no, I just meant when you actually heard, like, they dropped this bomb on Japan. I mean, do you remember how it was described to you? Or yeah, the, the main description was it killed a quarter of a million people. It dropped an atomic bomb and it wiped out the city of Hiroshima. The war's going to end. And as I said, the, the Japanese didn't believe that we had any more. We said, well, Okay, three days later on August the 9th, the first one was dropped August the 6th. August the 9th, a boxcar went to Nagasaki and dropped another one. 
And they said, well, we know you're done now, but the, the information was that our negotiators went to them and said, we got another one. Here's a picture of it and everything. And this one's coming down the smoke pipe in downtown Tokyo where you guys all live. And they quit. That's how they settled the war. The next one's coming down mid down right down Tokyo. Did you ever keep in touch with any of your crewmates? Not really. I don't know what happened to any of them. Uh, you know, maybe for a year or two, we had uh, exchange letters or phone calls, but n never followed through with any of them. None of them. Which is, I don't know, what well, far for the course because we were just thrown together as a crew and and. Uh, Everybody who was older than I was, I think, made a difference too. Now, I think you didn't you do honor flight? I, yes, I did. I did honor flight. What? It's laying here somewhere. Yeah, over there. Yeah, I took the honor flight <coughs> five years ago, and I went to Washington D.C. with a friend of mine. And instead of the one-day fly, we we took an RV, a, a couple in Brazil's Ohio, offered to take veterans to the the honor flight to Washington and they paid for it and stuff so we had a three day trip one day in day in Washington like they have and then uh, uh, another day home so that was really really great and I got to talk to Bob Dole for a while you know he every day at noon at lunch he'd come down and shake hands with the veterans and I just happened to be standing right where his car stopped so I stood there a while and talked to Bob Dole, which to me was quite an honor, because he was a, a big soldier, you know, he could, his one hand was this, and he, he could hardly walk. So, yeah, that was a that was a big highlight for me to talk to Bob Dole. Yeah, here, the whole honor flight thing that we, that, that, that's a really good one. Some of the guys are still doing that. Uh, one of, I belong to American Business Club, and one of my guys on the American Business Club, he left uh, Saturday, day before Easter, for one of the honor flight to uh, Washington, which is very, very impressive. And they fly out of Dayton? Yes, they fly out of Dayton to, to Washington, all in one day. And But that that trip there is, is very, very uh, inspiring that they, that they built there. So I guess I I guess I've lived a long life. Uh, as I said, we're celebrating our 70th wedding anniversary, June the first. I'm still. Well, can you tell us what your plans are for June first? Yes, we're go we're going to have a. We just sent out the invitations to uh, like 70 people, and we're having at the NCR Country Club in the dog road room uh, and we'll have a big uh, open bar and hell bent for anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're going to have a big celebration. We had one on our 50th, 55th, 60th, 65th, and now the 70th. But I, I told them at the last one that, uh, gee, we'll soon be able to have it at a six table bar room, <laughs> two table instead of a big convention center. <laughs> so we are looking forward to that. and. Uh, two years ago, I went to the Arctic fishing yet, way up in toward Ye at Hatchet Lake, which is up toward Yellowknife, way up north there, 600 miles north of Saskatoon. And uh, I had so much fun and told my friends there's good stories about it. They came to me and said uh, last fall, "Hey, Ralph, will you, can you take us up to Hatchet Lake again one more time?" Because when I was up there, I was the oldest guy that ever been there, Hatchet Lake. <coughs> and so I said, okay, because we made reservations last November already and everything's paid for and, and July the 1st we're leaving, so uh, I'm getting close to having to try to make that trip yet. And uh, just to let these guys see what it's like, I, I, I told every one of them that uh, you'll know you're there when you see evergreens go by the airplane window. 
<laughs> well, thank you very much. Okay, you're welcome. I really enjoyed it very much, and and it's been a good day. Well, now you <coughs> you told Brian this was going to happen on June the first, and you wrote on your paper here's June the ninth. You got married? Yes, the the country club was taken up for that one, so we did it a week early. Okay, all right. That explains that? It sure does. <laughs> okay, Ralph, thank so, you very much hey, for doing this interview, and thank you for your service. Hey, you, I, you, finally got, you finally got me, and I appreciate you doing this for <laughs> me, because, you know, records are lost right and left since the war, and uh, everybody has a little piece to present that, to you, and, and I think uh, you assemble all of this in the Library of Congress. It, builds a complete picture, and I'm sure that every time you interview somebody, you, you hear something you didn't know. Well, like the third atom bomb. Like the third atom bomb. 